Hey, we're wrapping up our April series here at Grace Church. I have really enjoyed this series. It's called Taking a Closer Look. And what we're doing is we're doing a double take of sorts at four different events, four different locations that are associated either with or around the Easter theme, the resurrection of Christ. Here's what we've looked at so far. Uh, so far. If you've got your notes that you've printed off, uh, make sure you write these things down or you can write them down and put them in a note paper and keep that for later. First week, we looked at the garden. The garden is where Jesus, and here's a couple of thoughts, where Jesus uh, prayed, but also where he was betrayed. He prayed and he was betrayed there by one of his closest followers. Then on Easter Sunday, we looked at the tomb. It was at the tomb Jesus was both buried and where he was raised from the uh, dead. <clears throat> Jesus uh, gave his life as a sacrifice for you and I. He paid the penalty for our sin and made it possible that you and I could have a relationship with his Father, have our sins forgiven, and spend eternity in heaven. So the tomb is where Jesus was buried, but also where he was raised. Last week, we looked at the boat. The boat was a place, we said, uh, where he called and he restored, called and restored Simon Peter. Simon Peter had denied Christ three times. When we come to the story in the boat, as we looked at it all this past week, um, Peter had again failed. It, failure seemed to be a normal part of Simon Peter's life. He highly trained uh, professional fishermen. He and the boys, they're out fishing, had fished most of the night, and they had caught absolutely nothing. And it just goes to show that even with our best um, training, with being have, having sincere hearts, doing our very best, you and I control very little in life. If we've learned anything over the past two months, it's how little control we as human beings have on anything in life. <clears throat> so that is something we can learn. Failure is natural. Failure is human. But God can use the failures in our life to teach us very, very valuable lessons. With that in mind, we um, <clears throat> are going to be looking at another appearance of Christ. Uh, in the story of last week, he had made an appearance following his resurrection several weeks later. In toll, in all in toll, there were 13 different appearances, at least that uh, are identified by most scholars, in which Jesus, after he was raised from the uh, dead, made himself known to a wide variety of people. And in your notes uh, or on our website, you will see a link that will uh, provide for you a printout uh, explaining these 13 different appearances if you like to do more study in that area. Last week, we looked at uh, the eighth appearance of Christ. It took place on what we would say is the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. Three times in the book of Matthew, Jesus had told his disciples that he would meet them in Galilee. One, <clears throat> he told them that before he died, and then afterwards. He kept reminding them. Now, because they're down in Jerusalem, they're 70 to 90 miles away, they have to hoof it, if you will, hike back up north to Galilee. And that would make sense to them because a good number of those men were from Galilee. So three times, specifically in the book of Matthew, he tells them to go north, and that is where we find Peter in the boat, and they're fishing. Jesus meets him there on the northwest uh, corner of that Sea of Galilee. That story last week talked about failure, and it's an important lesson. We all fail, but we can all rebound from it. Failure is what we do. It's not who we are. And Jesus taught him a very valuable lesson. No matter how sincere you are, no matter how much effort you put forth, no matter what your training level is, sometimes situations are out of your control. And what you attempt to do, you're going to fail. But it's in the midst of the failure, we learn something about ourselves, we learn something about our situation, and we definitely will learn something about Christ. And he wants his boys to understand that apart from trusting him completely and obeying what he tells us to do, there's going to be no real spiritual success in our life. So that's what we've covered up to this point. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Matthew in the very last chapter, chapter 28. So I'm going to give you a chance to turn there, and we're going to look at 
um, our last message in the series. Matthew 28. It is here that Jesus makes his ninth appearance. Again, if you've got that list of appearances, those are 13 of the more commonly agreed upon and recognized appearances of Christ that are recorded in Scripture. I can't say how many times Jesus made himself known to people besides those 13. <clears throat> As we look at that ninth appearance, this is an appearance that is very, very important. When he rose from the grave, he began to show himself alive in a new spiritual form to his disciples. He has been leading for the last two to three weeks up to this appearance that we're going to look at. This appearance summarizes his entire life, summarizes his entire ministry. And everything Jesus did was always purposeful. And he has been telling him, go to Galilee, go to Galilee, go to Galilee, and there's a reason. And it's because of this ninth appearance. So you're in Matthew 28. We're going to look at verse 16 through 20. All four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, often tell the same story, a scenario of, G of an event that Jesus is teaching or he's involved in. And, but oftentimes we get four different views of that story. So while one story, no one story has all of the details, the other stories sort of are color commentating, if you will, adding additional information. So when we come to Matthew 28, this story is given to us in all four Gospels <clears throat> in the sense that the same message is repeated. And again, in the book of Acts, just before Jesus ascends to heaven, the same subject, the same message again is talked about. It's got to be important for the Lord to spend that much uh, time, that much energy in having the writers of the Gospels record information that's for our benefit. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. In verse 16, there's a three-week period of time that is skipped by Matthew. If you look at verse 15 and verse 16, approximately three weeks there. But that period of time between verse 15 and verse 16 is covered by the other three uh, gospel writers. In, last week, we saw uh, an example of that, just looking at uh, the writings of John. So in Matthew 28, 16, three weeks have gone by from verse 15. Now we find him in Galilee. And it says in verse 16, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee. So from verse 15 up to here, there's a three-week period where they've gone up to Galilee. What happens in Galilee? Well, one of the things was last week, the fishing uh, expedition in the boat. But notice, it sort of jumps ahead. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to where? The mountain. We have looked at the garden. We've looked at the tomb. We've looked at the boat. Guess what we're going to look at now? Yep, the mountain. And it says to the mountain where Jesus had what? told them to go. Now, we know three times he said, go to Galilee. There's, there's no written record of saying, go to the mountain. Evidently, in John uh, 21, when we looked at the fishing expedition, he at that point told them to go to a particular mountain within that immediate area. Notice what it says in verse 17. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Now, I want to just share a few thoughts here about verse 16 before we go on. The reason that it says there's 11 disciples is because Judas Iscariot, one of the key leaders of the movement, had betrayed the Lord, had sold him out because Jesus was not ringing all of his bells. Jesus was not doing everything that Judas thought he should do. It's amazing, but we see this all the time in our life, how a trusted friend can turn on you if you don't do what they want you to do or they misunderstand your motives. The same thing happens today. We shouldn't be surprised by this. Judas then commits suicide. Rather than 12 disciples, there are 11. Now, the word disciple in the biblical sense and in cultural sense means a follower. And it's not somebody who lags behind. It's somebody who's very, very close to you. And in the Jewish context, they would walk right behind a master teacher, the rabbi, several steps behind. And they would observe the rabbi. They would listen to the rabbi. They would do the things that the rabbi would tell them to do because it was their desire not just to follow and be in proximity, but to become like. 
So when we talk about somebody being a disciple of Christ, it's somebody who wants to be just like Jesus. And the only way you can do that is you've got to have a relationship with them and you have to stay close. So the word disciple means follower. But when it's used of these 11 people, and the word 11 is attached to the idea of disciples, the 11 disciples, it carries more than just a follower. They are followers, but it means more than that. It's a reference to those who are apostles. We often hear the phrase, the 12 apostles. These are 12 apostles, but they're, they're also followers. It's both and. You can be a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ, have a relationship with him, but you're not an apostle. You haven't been given that title by the Lord. Now, the word apostle is a unique term. In the American culture, we really have no concept in our vocabulary, uh, no concept that captures the essence of what that word means. If you were to look it up in a dictionary from that era, the word apostle means an envoy, an ambassador, a messenger. Now, we have ambassadors, but not to the extent that this word is, con uh, the meaning of this word is, is conveying it. The closest we would have in this term, in our culture, somebody who would have been an ambassador or an apostle in this sense is somebody like Ben Franklin, who truly represented the American president, the American Congress, the American people in the courts of France and in the courts of England. Somebody who uh, had tremendous power and whatever that ambassador would say would totally represent our nation. There was no second guessing it. It is an envoy, an ambassador, a messenger who is commissioned and who has been authorized to carry out the instructions of a higher authority. The word apostle, if you had heard the word apostle in this culture, you would have heard air being sucked in <gasps> because it meant somebody who was extremely important. It literally would carry this meaning. If you see me, I carry the word apostle, I'm, or the title. If you see me, you see the one who sent me. I have the power. I have the authority. I have the commission of the one who sent me. The word apostle never draws attention to itself. And be careful if you ever hear somebody designate themselves as an apostle. An apostle never promotes himself. An apostle always promotes the person who has sent them, and in this case, Jesus. So it says the 11 disciples who are apostles. Another thought is this. It says they go to the mountain. God speaking to people either on or from a mountain is throughout the scripture, both Old and New Testament. Whether he is speaking in person, God, God is speaking through his, his own voice, or he is speaking through a prophet. Many examples of that in Scripture. Think of these people. Noah is associated with God on a mountain after the ark landed. Abraham, God spoke to him on a mountain. Moses, definitely, we know that story. Elijah, same mountain as Moses, much later, God speaks to him there. Joshua, on top of a mountain with the people of Israel on another, uh, separated between two mountains and Joshua giving what is known as the blessings and the curses of, to the people of Israel as they inherit the prom promised land. And then Jesus, we have numerous times in his ministry where he is speaking to his followers from a mountain. God speaking to people from a mountaintop is very, very important. Usually it's associated with en engaging the presence of God, you and God together so that uh, you are spending time with him. It's a time of revealing spiritual truth. It's a time of gaining a fresh perspective on life. Uh, you're caught up in a particular situation and so you retreat to a mountaintop and you look over the edge of the mountain, you look at, and sometimes when you're higher up, you just get a different perspective, especially when God is next to you and he's pointing certain things out that he wants you to understand. It's a time of getting direction for our life. God wants us to get away with him so he can speak into our life and speak into our ministry so that we know the next steps. And mountains in the Bible are associated with um, uh, receiving a commission from the Lord to represent him for a particular task that he wants us to carry out. So we've looked at the word apostle. We've looked a little bit about the concept of a mountain. 
okay? Now, here's some things to look at. If you look in verse 17, it says they're up on this mountain here, and it says some doubted, some doubted. Now, this isn't referring to the apostles. Remember, the apostles have been with Jesus for three and a half years. Their faith has been slowly growing as Jesus has revealed himself to them, and their little human minds are able to grab onto the concepts that Jesus is teaching. But remember, this is like the ninth appearance. Jesus has shown himself alive. He's allowed uh, people to look at his wounds, to even put a hand into the spear wound into his side. So it is not referring to the apostles here, some doubted, because notice it says they believed. But it says some doubted, not the apostles, some doubted. Who are they? Many people, many Bible commentators believe this is a group of people that uh, the apostle Paul references in 1 Corinthians 15 and verses 5 and 6. 1 Corinthians 15, 5 and 6. Paul is documenting the resurrection of Christ. And he says in verse 5 of that chapter, Jesus was seen by Peter and then by the 12. Again, you'd have to go back through the appearances to see what Paul is referencing. He's not talking about everything, but he's pointing out a few things that these Corinthian people would understand. He was seen by Peter. He was then seen by the 12. And then in verse 6, it says this. After that, after he showed himself to Peter, now you have to look at the list of appearances. Look at when he talks to Peter. After that, he was seen by, now catch this, by more, more than, more than, say the words, more than 500 of his followers at one time. Now, when was the last time you were in a group of 500 people? Just think of what that would be. If we used every chair that we have here at Grace, every chair, both the nice comfy ones and the plastic ones, would have 500 chairs. 500 chairs in this auditorium, it would be jam-packed. He showed himself alive to them at one time. A mountaintop experience can literally be life-changing. Literally life-changing. And this is what we see here. Christ has pulled a group of people, his key leaders, and he's pulled a large number of other followers from that region. Because remember, Galilee is where Jesus did most of his ministry. And he gets them up onto a mountaintop, and he's going to speak to them. Now, <clears throat> the height of the mountain isn't all that important. Some mountains in the Bible sometimes are what you and I in America would call nothing more than rolling hills but they're a high spot from the rest of the land. The height isn't important. What's important is the attitude of the people who are there at that moment and their willingness to listen to God. A mountaintop experience can be totally life-changing. It's a time when you get alone with the Lord and you allow Him to speak into your life. And if we're open, if we're teachable, if we're hungry, God will guide us. He will open our mind to understand truth and he will show us the next steps for our life. A lot of people are saying, especially in light of where our government is trying to reopen our economy, trying to reopen our nation, go back to normal living. Uh, one of the things we need to do as Christians is have some mountaintop times. Get away just with the Lord and say, Lord, what would be the next steps for our church? What are the next steps that you would have me as a parent to do with my family? What are the next steps, Father, for our business, not just do what we've always done, but really listen to God guide us through this reopening. But we can't do that unless we get alone with him. Now, you're in Matthew 28. Let's look at our text here. This is the fourth event and location that I have covered during this series. Remember, we've looked at the garden. We looked at the tomb. We've looked at the boat. Now we're looking at the mountain. It says in verse 16, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain. The word the is important. It's a specific mountain, not any old mountain. It is a mountain, and it's the mountain that he had told them to go to. When we understand that Jesus had told them to go to Galilee, he had a specific mountain in mind. 
the Gospels don't tell us the name of the mountain because the name of the mountain isn't as important as what takes place upon the mountain. But what I've done in, on a map that hopefully you can see, there are three red dots or three red stars. And those three stars represent potentially the three mountains. One of three was this mountain because of the location. At the very top of the Sea of Galilee, you see a red star. This would represent the Mount of Beatitudes. It's where Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount earlier in his ministry. It's at the top of the uh, Sea of Galilee. He had given his message there to his followers about the values that his Father holds dear. He lays out for them the principles whereby we as Christian people are to live, how we are to treat one another, how we are to respond to the world around us, and how you and I are to relate to God. The Mount of Beatitudes very well could have been this mountain. They were familiar with it. They had been there. And if where Jesus had just been with Peter, he could have turned, if I am looking at the southern part, at the northern part, looking down to the southern part of the Sea of Galilee, if you can see, if you remember that from the map or from your teachings here at Grace, Jesus simply would have turned and pointed to that mountain. It was right there. It wouldn't have taken him but a half hour to get up to the top of that. A second option is Mount Arbel. Mount Arbel, it was been, would have been to Jesus's, uh, or to, if you look at your map, it would be to the immediate left. If Jesus is standing at the northern part looking to the southern, he would have gone over here is the Mount of Beatitudes, and over here he would have pointed this way to his right, to your left looking at the map, the Mount of Arbel. It is an imposing mountain. It stands far above the Sea of Galilee. The cut into the mountain is... Um, one of the most photographed place, photographed images in all of Israel. And if you're seeing a, a picture there, you would, you're seeing from the top of Mount Arbel looking down at the plain of Genereset and also looking at the Sea of Galilee. The third option is to the southwest of the Sea of Galilee, and that is what is known as Mount Tabor. It, it's a mountain that stands out from its entire surroundings because of its shape. It's simply like a bowl. It stands there all alone. It's like, how did this mountain get dumped here? Now, while that some people believe that could have been the mountain, we have no record of Jesus ever being there. Nothing written. Whereas the first two mountains, we do. And they both would make sense because within a half hour, you would have been to both mountains. Both Beatitudes and our bell. The mountain has relevance because Jesus is going to, to talk about something that's incredibly important. He lays out for his disciples, his followers, the game plan for the rest of their lives. And really the game plan for you and I, even 2,000 years later. Jesus has always used symbolism in history of a location to enhance his teaching, to really get the truths to sink in. And on top of um, this mountain, Jesus has some important words because it lays out the next 2,000 years of what he expects his people to do. I liken this moment unto a, um, a great locker room talk from a coach to the players. Probably the greatest um, locker room halftime talk or pregame talk that's ever been given, at least in all the surveys that I read this week, uh, was from Herb Brooks, to our 1980 hockey team at Lake Placid. The U.S. were the underdogs. They were rank amateurs, if you will. And they were playing the greatest hockey team in the history of the world, the Soviet Union. And it was considered the greatest sports upset there has ever been. And if you uh, have ever watched the movie Miracle, uh, with Kurt Russell playing the part of Herb Brooks, you see, you can hear the speech, you can sense it. If you have any competitiveness within your system, it will make you a little bit crazy. I watched it again this week and I teared up. Having been a person who was a coach and an athlete, that type of speech is what I want from a coach before I go out and give my all on a playing field. And this is exactly what Jesus is doing to his disciples. 
having been part of a team as a player, having coached teams for well over 30 some years, various teams of all kinds, pushing 40 years in the coaching uh, aspect of my life, I understand that there are players who are totally sold on the coach, totally grasp the game plan and are committed to it. And they're one with their teammates. They support each other. They encourage each other. They pick one another up. I understand what that is like. But I also understand that there are people that can be present on a team, definitely, who aren't as convinced, who aren't as confident. So they don't go forward with all. They give half an effort. They hold something back. And as coaches, we always say to our players, leave it all on the field. And that is what Jesus is about to tell them. You've got to leave it all on the field. But notice, the apostles believe. The team captains believe. Not all of the players believe because some of them doubted. Do you catch that in verse 17? They saw him. The apostles worshiped him. But some of the players weren't as committed as what the captains of the team were. That's why uh, what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15 about the 500 totally makes sense. <clears throat> They're there with their head coach and, if you will, the captains or the assistant coaches. They have every opportunity to have their doubts expressed, to ask questions, to clarify directions, but also to make plans. And after this meeting, Christianity is launched. 500 plus people at one time have seen the resurrected Lord. They've heard him speak. They've had a chance to put their hands, their fingers into the nail and touch his wound if they want. Ask questions. What was it like to die? What was it like to come back? What were your first thoughts? Think on this. 500 believers at one time. We know there's over 500 because you've got to throw the apostles in there too. If every one of them had been called into a court of law, think of our legal system, and every one of them, if for nothing else, had been asked to give a 10-minute eyewitness testimony of that mountaintop experience. So, did you meet Jesus? How do you know it was Jesus? What did Jesus say to you? What did he say that convinced you to do what you have been doing with your life? And that's telling others about him. Ten minutes. You get ten minutes. Tell me about this resurrected Christ. Think about that. If every one of those believers gave a ten-minute eyewitness testimony of what they had seen, what they had heard, what they had experienced, that would be 5,100 minutes, 85 hours, nonstop, eyewitness testimony. Think about it. If there was a trial today and they paraded over 500 eyewitnesses, they are limited to 10 minutes, and each witness totally collaborated everything that the other witnesses said. You've got well over 500 witnesses telling you the same story for 85 nonstop hours. Would you be a believer? Or would you totally dismiss the eyewitness testimony? Only a fool would do that. Only a fool. It's no wonder that within 25 years of this moment on this mountaintop, spending time with the resurrected Christ, that the Christian faith began to spread throughout the world and changed cultures within 25 years. Even hostile authors, writers of that time period, verify the fact that Jesus lived and verify the story of the resurrection and verify the story of the movement of Christian believers. Many of those believers gave their lives for this story. Years later, dying for their faith, not renouncing it, is it any wonder the Christian faith has grown? Only a fool or a person who has, prede has a predetermined bias to reject Christianity so that they can live the way they want to live with no accountability. It's called a selfish, sinful life. Only that type of person would look at the historical evidence and reject it. So let me ask you today, who are you? What kind of person are you? 
Are you a solid, committed believer in Jesus Christ? Do you have doubts? There's nothing wrong with doubts. Then you need to examine the evidence. Or are you a person who's stuck your head in the sand, turn your back to the truth just because you want to live a selfish, self-centered lifestyle with the thought of no accountability? People say, well, I can't believe something that I can't see. Think of the virus going around. Can you see it? Can you personally see it, but yet you accept it? That fact has totally changed the way that you live. Just because you haven't seen something doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Let's look at what takes place here on the mountain. This passage is often referred to as what many scholars would call the Great Commission. It really is called the, we could refer to it as the Everyday Commission. It's the way that you and I are to live our lives every day that we are alive. Now, it's called great because of the tasks that it had to accomplish. And that is to take the message of the resurrected Christ to the rest of the world. Jesus summarizes his own purpose here on earth, passes it to all of those, all those who claim to follow him, and it's passed to you and I too. In the closing verses of all four Gospels and, the, and in the opening verses of the book of Acts, Jesus lays out the mission for Christianity, for every believer and for every church. Here on the mountain, I think you see a picture of me on the top of Mount Arbel. This is the mountain that I believe this took place at because of the view that it has of the entire region. Because Jesus is going to tell the, his followers, you have to go to the world. And standing at that spot where I am seated, you can see in a 360 uh, degree turning of your body, every area, every type of people group that Jesus was about to send his disciples to. And he gives this great locker room talk. I think there's several reasons. It, the mountain was right there. It totally makes sense. But more than that, you get the view of all the regions that Jesus is sending them to. Because he says, I'm sending you to all nations. And he could point in every direction from there. But I think there's a third reason why Jesus chose Mount Arbel and not another area. Simply because of the history associated with this mountain. It is on this mountain that the Jewish people and their faith had been attempted to be extinguished first by the Assyrian army that marched through there and brutally slaughtered the Jewish people who lived on or near that mountain. Then there was a group called the Seleucids. You'd have to do your history. They did the exact same thing, came to that mountain and tried to wipe out the Jewish faith from that, uh, on, in that region. And then there was um, King Herod of the Romans. So you have three great empires, the Syrians, the Seleucids, the re remnants of the Greeks, and the Roman Empire that did the exact same thing. They came to this mount, attempted to extinguish the Jewish faith, and Jesus is about to launch the Christian faith from that point. And I think every one of those followers would have been thinking, this is dangerous. There are going to be people who there are going to be people who don't like what we're talking about. People are going to try to persecute us. People who are going to try to wipe us out. And Jesus is saying, exactly right, folks. It is from this launching pad of death that we are going out with life to the world. Here's three thoughts. Look at verse 18 with me. In your notes, you can fill in the magic word there. Jesus claims all authority. Jesus claims all authority. Matthew 28, 18. Then Jesus came to them and said this, all authority, the word all means all. It doesn't mean some, it means all. All authority, which means the right to give orders, to make decisions, to enforce obedience. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now you got to think about that. Throughout the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus emphasizes authority. From chapter 7, his authority in teaching. Chapter 8, his authority in healing. Chapter 9, his authority in forgiving sins. Chapter 10 of Matthew, the, his authority over Satan, evil spirits, diseases, and sicknesses. The whole book of Matthew is about his authority. And then he reminds them of that 
here in Matthew 28. His, some of his last words are this. Remember, guys, I've got all authority. I've demonstrated it in all these other areas, so I've got all authority. And he says all. He didn't say some. So you got to ask yourself, self, if Jesus has all authority to give orders, if he has all authority in not only heaven and earth, how much authority do you have in your life then? Mull that over for a second. If all authority belongs to Jesus, how much do you have? What he's about to tell his boys comes with this reminder that I think made their little Adam's apples go up and down. He's saying, guys, listen here. At Grace, we say smack, smack. He's trying to get their attention. I've got all authority. He didn't have to say, you don't have any authority. He said, I do. It's high time we as Christians understood that. Jesus gives us a commission that he wants us to accomplish with a small little life span that we have. You don't get a second chance here on planet Earth. You get one chance, one go around. And Jesus says, remember, I've got all authority. You may live in America where you have the right to vote and you think you have a right to, a, to your opinion. In God's economy, he has all authority. And our love and our devotion to him should motivate us to do what he wants us to do. So first and foremost, Jesus claims all authority. Because he has all authority, we go to number two. Jesus highlights, or you could use the word, identifies our activity. Okay, you've got all authority, Jesus. What do you want me to do? Should be the natural response of all believers. Matthew 28, 19, and the first part of verse 20. Are you there? Jesus said, because I've got all authority, he uses the word, therefore. Based upon the fact I've got all authority, therefore, here's a change. Something we're to do because of what he previously has said. Go and make disciples of all nations. The command in that passage is not the word go. It's the phrase make disciples. You are to make followers. You are to win people to the Christian faith. You are to answer their questions. You're to love on them. You're to care for them. You're to meet their needs. You're to point them towards me. And as they become disciples, you're to do something. He highlights our activity. We're to go make disciples of all nations. The word nations means people groups. Now, Jesus is probably pointing out to the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. The nations that are represented there, are very, it's the Jewish people. They're very, very uh, committed Jewish people. They're synagogues in that entire northwest corner of Galilee. As he would point over across the Sea of Galilee from, if you remember the picture where I was seated, he's pointing to the northeast corner where there's the zealots. They were somewhat religious, but they were very stubborn. They hated the, the Roman people. They wanted to overthrow the government. So he's pointing to two different types of Jewish people. There are those that are very much committed to religion, and there are those who are more com committed to a secular viewpoint of living. And he says, guys, you have to reach both of them. You're very similar to them in many of your respects. We have to figure out how to take the gospel message to religious people and to people who are really uh, religious but more secular in their lifestyle. And then he points over to the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, the Decapolis area, 10 cities full of pagans. He says, you got to figure out how to reach the pagan people. Those people don't even know about my father. They don't even know the uh, difference between right and wrong. They totally live in the moment. They're caught up in a selfish desire to please themselves and to heck with the rest of the world. And then he points down the western shore of the Sea of Galilee to the capital city called Tiberias. It's where Herod lived. It's where he had his palace. He says, and guys, that's the existing authorities in our culture. It is the Roman Empire. They're totally secular, and they're pagan, not like the pagans across the shore. They're pagan, and they worship self. They worship Caesar. And he points out the playing field for his team. He says, I am giving you the commission to go and make disciples of all of them. You're to bring them into an awareness of who I am and who my father is. And you're to teach them and help them 
to do exactly what I'm sending you to do. When he tells them to make them disciples, he's not telling them to get people in church. And he's surely not telling them to become church members or church attenders. The Christian faith is rarely about church. Church is where God's people come together to grow together, to encourage one another, to be built up in their faith so that they can go carry out this mission. So he's not saying just come sit in a church. You see, disciples are like members of a good family. They're committed one to another. He wants them to grow. He wants them to have healthy, godly values. He wants them as disciples to serve and sacrifice for a cause bigger than themselves. He wants disciples to reach out. It's a world of difference between attending church and being a disciple, a true follower of Jesus. And again, you've got to take a good hard look at yourself and say, who are you today? Who are you today? 500 plus people left that mountaintop committed to reach the known world. And in 25 years, they had accomplished most of that. Here's the third thing that we're going to see in this passage. First of all, Jesus claimed all authority. It's all his. Because he has authority, he has the right to tell us the activity of how we're to live our life. And the third thing we see is Jesus gives his assurance. His assurance. If you look at verse 20, the last half of the verse, he says, Surely I am with you always. Now, depending on your version of the Bible, you could say, lo, I am with you always, or behold, I am with you always. Here, the word in my version says, surely. It literally, the word surely is a term that anybody that's ever played sports, team sports, where you're going head to head with an opponent on a field or a court, you can understand. In football, for years, I coached football and I coached offensive linemen. And I told them that when you're blocking a person on a pass play, you put their hands right into their chest and you keep your eyes focused on their chest. Because if you look into their eyes, they'll give you an eye fake and you'll go one way, they'll go the other. If you're looking down at their feet, you're, you're, they're going to give you a little shuffle and you go one way, they go the other. Wherever your hands and your eyes are, whether it's blocking out somebody in basketball, whether it's uh, blocking somebody in football, you have control over the situation. And what he's telling him is this, you've got to keep your eyes on me. He doesn't say, surely I'm with you. I'm tagging along with you wherever you want to go. The idea of a Jewish rabbi is this, they're behind him. He's saying, keep your eyes, behold, I am with you. That's right, I'm leading you. You better know where I am. I'm going to lead you to the very end of the age. He gives us assurance that as long as our eyes are focused on him, our heart's desire is to please Him, then we're going to be successful. We're going to reach our friends and family for Christ. Our church will make disciples of those people within our community. But we've got to keep our eyes on Him. As we go through this whole cultural COVID thing here that's going on in our country, our community, our country, our world, we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. He's going to lead us to the people in the people groups that He wants us to minister to. He uses the situations of life not to get us to sit uh, passively in our homes and eat our Twinkies and watch reruns. He wants us to, he cre he's created this environment to get our attention, to figure out how we can reach our neighbors, how we can reach our community, how we can minister to the needs of people who are really hurting. He gives, our, he gives assurance here. I want you to make disciples. Remember, I've got all authority. That's what you live for. And you'll do it if you keep your eyes on me. Take your directions from me. Here's the thing. They're sitting on this mountaintop. And then he releases them. I'll never forget my senior year, my high school football coach, Nick Stevens, gave us a great pep talk. Was it as good as Herb Brooks's? I don't know, but it was right up there. We, were, we took our helmets and we're beating them on the floor. We're hitting the lockers with them. We're shoving each other. We're ready to take the field. And when he said go, we literally broke the door down, going out of the locker room onto the field. I wonder what it would have been like to have been one of these people on the mountain with Jesus. You've just seen somebody who was dead who has come back to life. 
there's a lot of high five going, a lot of, in athletic terms, back slapping, butt slapping. Let's go. We can do this. Yeah. Somebody says, but what if we, and here's what they would say. What if we what? What if we have to sacrifice? What if we have to suffer? What if we have to submit to authorities that don't care about us? We will please God with our obedience. Here's what we've talked about in our series. The first week was the garden. Remember, the garden is where Jesus prayed and where Jesus was betrayed. Then we moved on to the tomb, and it was in the tomb that Jesus was buried. But hey, Jesus was also raised. Our darkest moments can bring the greatest changes in our life. Then we went to the boat. It's a place where Peter was called and where Peter was restored. Even when we fail, God loves us and he wants us to get up and keep moving. And then we come to the mountain. It's at the mountain that we're reminded of who Jesus is. We're reminded of what he's done for us. We're reminded of what he wants us to do. And in the mountain is where they were reminded and then commissioned to change their world. That would be my prayer for you. I hope you've enjoyed the series. This uh, week we're going to finish up this series. Uh, on Wednesday at 1 o'clock, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the people on that mountain. But we'll, And on Friday at 5, we're going to look a little bit more at the um, head coach, if you will, at Jesus as he gave that uh, commission to them. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for your life. We thank you for your death. We thank you for working in us. May we be obedient to you. May we leave the locker room, whether it's our homes, our churches, our places of work, our schools, and make a difference in somebody's life for you. Uh, we pray that you continue to speak into our life this week. It's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen.